This is lecture two of the harmonization uh, uh, section of our of our um, advanced theory project, uh, and uh, you're going to hear me say this is lecture two like three times because I have spliced these videos together. Um, it's important that as we work through this, that you are able to listen to me and also play the examples. I'm looking over here at my computer just to make sure I've got these examples up. And so you're going to play through those and take your time through this lecture series. Take your time learning this craft um, and you'll have to probably play a section of it and then put it on pause and then play from your PDF or maybe you can see it on your computer, iPad, or whatever you're using. For this next assignment now, we're starting the second video of the uh, harmonization series. And I just want to say we'll be using the, um, looking here at my computer, the PDF by Dr. Barbara Murray. Uh, I'm going to be going through this, all of these steps. Uh, it's important to know that you're going to have to play that video over and over and over again. You can even take it in sections as I go through each step. Make sure you understand each of these steps, uh, each of these part writing rules. However, it's important to realize that, um, that these rules are, are going to seem awfully complex as we get into them. And so just relax, take them a step at a time, and, um, and remember, we're really after not memorizing the rules themselves as much as we are learning these sounds and learning the basic concepts. Uh, there will be no way around you calling me or writing me and we'll have to go through this over and over again. But you're going to learn this art. Uh, just see this video as a primer. Just a beginning. Just an introduction to this. And you're going to do just great. So this is the first part writing rule lecture. And I have pulled up now our PDF of the part writing rules by uh, Dr. Murphy at the University of Tennessee. She's in uh, the theory department there and has put out what I think is really the finest um, overview of part writing that we have. So we have this first rule, use proper notation. She doesn't have these listed out as rules as such uh, and the first few are, are uh, review for a number of you. But first, basically what this first one is saying is that when you're writing for the soprano, the stems will go up, alto stems will go down, tenor stems up, bass stems down. Uh, and then the second rule will be review for many of you that uh, you are writing a chord either in close or open position. Close position uh, means there is no interval between the soprano and the alto part and no interval between the alto and the tenor part. But open position leaves one space of an interval between soprano and alto and alto and tenor. So the interval missing there between the soprano and alto is a C. And you'll see the interval missing between alto and tenor is an E. Uh, so when we're part writing, we do not want to have two spaces between here and an interval, one interval space here. We're either going to be writing in close position or open position like that. That's a really important rule. I see that... Uh, broken a lot by novices and it makes a big difference when you're playing it at the piano or a keyboard you really don't hear that difference but when you have singers singing you're gonna listen to it and go there's something wrong here and that's uh, going to be the reason that the spacing between your parts isn't going to sound right sometimes we move on then to the next uh, rule here and they're just saying here that you keep their voices in their proper ranges and those ranges are out here for you. Um, sometimes I'm going to tell you that I think that uh, you don't want to go down that low in the bass part generally. You want to keep the bass part up in the G. And in the tenor, up on a high G like that, I'm frequently going to tell you, well, that's lawful. It'll sound okay, but with a lot of choirs, you might need to bring that down uh, to an F or so. Um, but this is one of those areas that I see a lot of novices break these rules big time on their first harmonizations. They'll have sopranos going way up to high C and altos going way down the bass range. And um, so it's best to learn this now so that the first time you have a group sing your, your piece, uh, it's sounding as similar as you think it should in your mind um, instead of not sounding all that great. 
this next rule she has maximum distances and basically if you just remember what I told you about close and open position up here that's going to be all we need to know for, for uh, now. We come to crossed voices and overlapping of voices. Uh, again, um, some of these rules you'll see uh, J.S. Bach himself would break, but we're trying to learn these pure rules to begin with. Crossed voices here you'll see that the uh, alto note is down in, in her their range below the tenor. Uh, and so uh, here with the overlapping of voices you have the tenor and the bass uh, both coming into that one note there. Um, and here again, we, we do break these rules from time to time, but we're just learning the basics for right now. Um, the use of contrary or oblique motion to the bass more frequently than a similar motion. So what's happening here is they're showing you that in contrary motion, the two voices move in contrary um, from their uh, con contrary motion from their original position. Soprano there going from an A to a C, and the alto goes from the F to the E. That is a very powerful sound. Here's oblique motion where one voice remains the same and the other moves. Similar is going to be the similar pattern of moving similar direction but the intervals aren't parallel. So here you have a, th um, a third here going to a fourth here. And then here you have exact parallel motion, a third going to a third. Well, generally parallel motion is a weak progression. And when we're talking about the, uh, using the, uh, the motion with the bass, uh, what they're saying here is that when you're writing with tenor and bass, it's best when possible to move in contrary motion. It's best, if you can't do that, to move in oblique fashion. You can use a similar motion if you want, but these are really the, the more powerful ways, the more smooth ways of moving from one chord to another. So none of these are bad. It's just in order of preference between voices, but especially between uh, your bass and your tenor. We come now here, never write in parallel unisons, parallel fifths, or parallel octaves. And here's an example of parallel fifths and an example of parallel octaves. Uh, pardon me, this is just an example of parallel fifths. Uh, and the fifth is between the bass in the alto to the bass in the alto and you're going to go why can't I write in parallel fifths well if you're writing in a parallel style of music you sure can but here again it is a weak progression when we're harmonizing in the Baroque and classical uh, um, uh, common harmonies um, double the stable tone in the chord, never double the leading tone, and so you'll see the leading tone here in the melody was going from that B to the C. They harmonize this and put B to C in the bass. It's going to be weak. It's going to sound weak. Um, and uh, so here it would have been better to put G in the bass. I won't go and harmonize the rest of that, but that's what they're saying. We don't want that kind of parallel movement. Uh, this next r rule, in root position triads, and this is generally, generally double the root. And so you see here in the key of F, you have this, um, this one chord F, they've doubled that uh, there. You have the minor six, and uh, they have doubled that there, and so on and so forth. It's just a stronger thing. This next rule now, this starts getting a little tedious. However, it's something important to really go by more your ear than by the analysis. In diminished triads, you're going to double the third uh, because it's not a note of the tritone. So here's a diminished second. Uh, the tritone is happening between that D and that A flat. And so the third of the chord is an F, and so we double that. Sometimes you can't do that. Uh, just depending on how the harmony is going to go. But this is a uh, preference. And if you're listening to your music and you hear you're having a hard time thinking how you're going to go from a diminished chord smoothly into the next chord and out of it, this is one rule that you're going to want to look at. In first inversion triads, double a stable tone or double the soprano or double the 1, 4, or 5 scale degree. 
And here's the example. They're going from a 1 to this uh, 7 diminished 6 to a 1 6. This 1 6 is in first inversion. And this ends up being a strong chord. They've doubled the soprano here in this particular case. Now I'm just going to tell you, with these two rules here, we start having to not um, pay quite so much attention as you're writing to these rules. It'll drive you insane as much as to your ear. And as you write more and more, you're going to hear these things. That's why I want you doing a lot of imitation um, when you're you're writing these chords out and then uh, playing them and experimenting. Where I come back to these rules frequently is when my music isn't sounding quite right in some of these more complex uh, chord progressions. And I'll look at that and go, okay, so this is the problem. I've uh, broken that rule and usually I can, I can handle it and, and make it sound decent. Uh, in second inversion triads, always double the bass. Here again, we have to break this rule quite a bit, uh, just practically speaking. But here's the second inversion. This is a C chord. The G is in the bass, and that G has been doubled up here. Again, why? Because if you double the uh, soprano or if you double the uh, tenor, it's going to be a weak progression, and uh, you're going to be um, frequently find yourself with parallel fifths and octaves. And you know, parale parallelism is going to be one of the number one things you're going to watch out for. Parallelism is going to make uh, many, many times, it's going to be the thing that's going to make the harmonic progression sound like, uh, it's not quite right. You know, you'll listen to it, you'll listen to choir <laughs> sing it, and if you look at it, you're going to find, uh, I've, got, I've got parallel fifths or octaves, or num another type of weak parallelism. Um, sometimes you're going to have an incomplete triad, so it's going to be leaving out the uh, fifth for some reason. Um, and so here's one, an incomplete triad, and they're saying double the root. Now, I just don't like these kinds of chords, um, and so I'm, you know by now, I've probably graded enough of your papers, you'll know I don't like seeing this where we've got C, C, C. I think we can be more creative than that, but sometimes when we're harmonizing, uh, we have to... Um, we have to make this kind of sacrifice. This next rule is pretty important. It's just saying um, when you're moving from one chord to the next, go to the closest tones possible. So if you've got an alto part that uh, say has a B and it's going to move to the next chord, uh, you know, don't go leaping up a sixth or, a, or, or the octave or whatever, or even a fifth. Uh, go to the next scale-wise tone that's as closest as possible. It's just going to be smoothness. And So remember, in these harmonizations, it's the smoothness of the harmonic rhythm, as smooth as we can make it, uh, that we're trying to accomplish. Because for, for vocal singing, uh, unless we're trying to have a jumpy effect of some sort, uh, it's always going to be easier on the singers and much easier on the ear. It's just going to sound right to make things smooth. This next rule uh, sounds more complex than it is. It's just saying, hey, don't be sneaky when you're moving to an octave or moving to a fifth. Uh, always look out for it because generally if you're moving in any kind of parallel motion to an octave or to a fifth, it's going to have the same effect as parallel octaves or parallel fifths. Moving in parallel wise motion is almost always weak. You know, it's kind of like going up to somebody and they're dressed nicely and uh, they, they look great. You go to shake their hand and it's like a wet wash rag. Okay, that's what this is saying here. Um, this next rule we're going to ignore for right now. Uh, they're just saying don't use augmented or diminished intervals melodically. Here, uh, you're in the key of uh, G minor, and so that uh, is not a B flat. So you've got a B natural, which makes that an augmented um, uh, note in that in that chord. Uh, so going from that B natural to an A flat is not in the scale. And they're saying, hey, don't use that in the melody. Um, <clears throat> but we're going to ignore that for right now because we're not going to have any assignments with that in there. And then we have... This next rule, resolving notes in the direction of their inflection, simply means 
um, you know, you have certain, there are certain notes that you know are going to resolve a certain way. For instance, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti. We all know that that's going to go to, you know, La. No. We all know it's going to go to La. Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, Do. And that's called the leading tone in that scale. We know exactly where that's going to go. Well, we want to resolve these things in a similar fashion. Uh, they're saying you can you can resolve down uh, to the fifth from that leading tone here. This key of C, that fifth is G. But even there, we would say we try to avoid that if at all possible. You want to resolve that leading tone whenever you can uh, to the C. That's C in this case. So going from B to the leading tone, uh, from the leading tone B to a C, uh, and in other keys, it's going to be the seventh of the chord, whatever that seventh is, um, being the leading tone, and resolve appropriately. We'll talk more about that later, So, but just generally, that's what we're talking about. The natural resolution of, of, of sounds. And then finally, how we resolve tritones, okay? Uh, if you were playing this in a piano, you're going to hear how this tritone resolves correctly here. Uh, we resolve tritones uh, in contrary motion. And that's really important. And you'll hear that in your music if you don't resolve it correctly.